In the last video, we looked at dipoles. So we looked at hydrogen chloride, quite specifically. Now, hydrogen chloride has its delta positive charge and its delta negative charge due to the electrons being pulled more towards the chlorine. And the word dipole, if you haven't guessed already, means two poles. So that's referring to this negative and positive end of the molecule. But does having one of these polar bonds mean that the entire molecule is polar? Well, in this case, certainly, because there is only this to the molecule, and this end is overall negative, and this one's positive. So let's look at some more examples to see if we can get to the bottom of this. Let's look at a very common molecule, CO2. Now, CO2 looks like this. And we have the CO bonds, or C double bond O bonds. So the C double bond O, oxygen, more electronegative than carbon, so it will draw its electrons towards it in this bond. We actually have four electrons there to be pedantic. So this end ends up delta negative, and this end delta positive. So these are delta positive, sorry, these are delta negative. So this is delta negative. Delta negative, and because we have essentially two times the amount of the positive charge shown here from both of these sides, we call this two delta positive. But is this molecule polar? No. This molecule is linear, it lies in a straight line. So these two polar bonds cancel each other out. The overall electron density we could draw as kind of this shape, with this yellow line being reference to the thing above it. So there is no net polarity there. Let's look at another example. How about boron trifluoride? Now boron trifluoride contains these boron fluoron bonds and fluorine being more electronegative than boron will draw the electrons towards it from the covalent bond so we end up with this delta negative delta negative delta negative and this three delta positive because of the reasons I said here we have three times the amount of this delta positive charge coming from these three bonds and at first glance this looks like this molecule would be polar because we have what looks like two times the neg negative amount here and only one of the negative amount at the top, so we'd have a more negative end of the molecule here. But that's not the case, because this negative area, this negative area, and this negative area cancel each other out. The electron density just looks like this. There is no bit of the molecule that stands out as being positive or negative. So again, there is no net polarity. So let's look at something that is polar. Probably the most famous example, water, H2O. These OH bonds, oxygen, more electronegative, so it draws the electrons towards it, like so. So we end up with a delta positive, delta positive, and two delta negative. Now, this is a bent molecule. So this part, this bottom part, is more positive than the top part, which is negative. So we end up with an overall delta negative end and an overall delta positive end. This molecule has net, has a net dipole. So in order to be a polar molecule, you have to have two things. You must contain at least one polar bond, and you must have a net dipole. So what do these polar molecules mean in terms of intermolecular bonding? 
Well, let's look at something which isn't polar. Let's look at hydrogen. Now, although this bond is covalent, perfectly covalent, the electrons aren't shared between one thing or the other in any uneven amount, how do these hydrogen molecules keep together in a group? Well, even though the electrons are perfectly shared, there is still the possibility, because remember, orbitals are just probability clouds for where electrons could be, there is still the possibility that for a split moment in time, both of the electrons will be more towards one than the other. So we will end up with a temporary dipole. If the electrons went to, let's say, the left. So we end up with this temporary dipole. Now, more often than not, the temporary dipole will, re will resort immediately back to a normal nonpolar molecule. But, let's go back for a moment to year 3 science class, when we were doing about magnets, and we were doing the experiment to see how many paper clips we could fit on the end of a magnet. These would be all touching each other. Now, you know that the positive end of this magnet will induce magnetism and make this negative, this bit positive, which will in turn make this bit negative, this positive, this negative, this positive, and by the time it gets to like the fifth one, it's kind of not magnetic enough to attach the other paper clips. We can apply this concept to these molecules. If we have the hydrogen molecule next to another hydrogen molecule, and this hydrogen molecule undergoes temporary dipole, so its electron cloud, for a split moment, gets pushed towards this end, so we end up with a delta minus and a delta positive end, then it will push the electron cloud of the other molecule away from it slightly, inducing a dipole in this molecule. So this temporary dipole has induced a dipole in another molecule, and this interaction will carry on and chain down other molecules and will actually stay around for some time. So these, although it will be constantly shifting, this interaction is going on enough that a bunch of these molecules will keep together. And these interactions are called van der Waals forces. Van der Waals, named after Johannes van der Waals, who was the guy that first discovered inter, uh, intermolecular forces. So a van der Waals force is the force of attraction between a temporary dipole and an induced dipole. And this is generally how things like liquids keep together. So, for an applied example of this, let's look at iodine. I've handily pre-drawn iodine here because it's fiddly to draw, you can see. So, iodine, I2. Iodine is non-polar, but when it undergoes these temporary dipoles and induces dipoles in another iodine molecule, it can form a crystal that looks like this. And this crystal has enough van der Waals forces to stay together in a solid form because iodine is such a light molecule. So what we essentially do is take a gaseous form of iodine and turn it straight away into a solid form of iodine. So what does this look like? Well. Each one of these yellow dots is a molecule of iodine, and you can see that it's still like gaseous iodine. But it has formed these van der Waals forces with each, each of these other 
iodine molecules to stay to connected in a crystal and this is technically called a face centered cubic crystal but that's university stuff and we'll go on to that a much later date so on a side note iodine is something uh, that is called sublime which means that it can go directly from a solid to a gas instead of going through the normal solid liquid gas transition state of matter because once one of these van der Waals forces break breaks you're not releasing liquid iodine you're releasing straight gaseous iodine that's just an interesting side note so what does this mean for how well rather how do these van der Waals forces affect things like boiling point well that really depends on two main things let's say the strength of these van der Waals forces depends on the size sorry start again the size of the molecule slash atom and the area area of contact between molecules so what does this mean for molecules well if, if the van der Waals forces are attraction between these molecules the stronger the van der Waals forces the harder it is to separate these molecules and thus the higher its boiling point is going to be so let's look at some examples uh, we can look at group zero we have helium all the way down to xenon and these are single atoms in helium its electrons are very close to the nucleus and in xenon they're quite far away so as a result it is more easy to manipulate the position of this electron than it is in the one in helium so this one is easier to induce dipoles in thus it has a larger boiling point we can see the same trend in group 7 in group 7 we go from fluorine to iodine and although these are diatomic molecules the size of fluorine is a lot smaller compared to iodine this means that the boiling point goes up from fluorine to iodine because this is less easily induced and this has a less easily induced dipole than iodine but then we can see the same trend in alkanes in alkanes we have short chains like C2H6 and then we have long chains like C8H18 now the boiling point also increases as we go down this but why this one doesn't have more easily induced dipoles because the size of these atoms aren't changing like in these periodic trends but the size of the molecule is and you see here that the size of the molecule affects the strength of the van der Waals forces because the area of contact that these molecules have is larger as we go down so in here we just have a simple carbon carbon and then these hydrogen and this area isn't going to be as in in much as contact as this c8 chain can't even draw it all here because it's so long but we'll just draw a c5 carbon chain this is going to have a much larger area of contact than this and this principle can also be applied to branched alkanes which I suppose I'll go on to a little bit now just to illustrate that example I'll have to erase this though because I'm running out of space sorry if you were paying attention to that so 
with the branch chains, if we look at C5, H12, we can draw this in a number of different ways. We can have this kind of carbon, hydrocarbon. I'm not going to bother drawing in the hydrogens, but you always should. I inherited this from my chemistry teacher. She's incredibly lazy as well. We can have a carbon chain that looks like this. And we can have a carbon chain that looks like this. These, of course, all representing hydrogens. This is why I love skeletal formula. We don't have to bother with this. So the area, the boiling point of these molecules is going to be different. And let's see if we can predict which one is going to have the highest and which one is going to have the lowest. Well, in this molecule, we have a high area of contact between molecules of this same isomer. So in this one, we're going to have slightly less because we're missing out on a whole big side of this carbon. And on this one, we're going to have even less because we only have four of these carbons in contact with other carbons at any time. So according to this theory, this should have the highest, the lowest boiling point. All right, sorry, uh, this should have the lowest boiling point and then this one should have the highest boiling point. So we can plot these trends on a graph to show what I mean. And I handy drew a graph earlier because again, a bit fiddly to draw on the spot and it would take about 20 minutes and we don't want to see that. So let's illustrate this trend. So I've kind of split the x-axis up here into three sections so that we can do the noble gases in this section, group seven in this, and then alkanes in this section. So, ta-da, as if by magic, I can switch this layer on and we can see the trends. So, with the noble gases, we see that as the atomic number goes up, the boiling point goes up. Because as the atomic number goes up, the size of the atom increases, and the stronger the van der Waals forces become. Because it is easier to induce a dipole in these larger atoms, so it is harder to break apart these intermolecular forces due to the stronger van der Waals forces. That's why the boiling point goes up. In group 7, we see the size and the atomic number of these elements go up. And as it does, it becomes easier to induce a dipole in all of these uh, diatomic molecules. And thus, it is harder to break these intermolecular forces. And in the alkanes, we see that as the number of carbons in the molecule go up, the stronger the van der Waals forces become and the, the higher the boiling point is. And it becomes stronger van der Waals forces because of this larger surface area for the van der Waals forces to occur. And that was the brief summary of the first intermolecular forces video. In part two, I'll talk about the permanent dipole forces. So I'll see you then.